Okay, we're now we're we've understood uh, what rates are. We're going to look at equilibrium and equilibrium constants. So, in order to handle this, uh, I'm going to give you a conceptual model that's stuck with me for most of my life. Uh, we'll try to make mathematics out of uh, this model and perform some calculations using our uh, mathematical. So here's my conceptual model. Uh, my uh, professors in my undergraduate years uh, actually did this. They, you know, stuck fish in aquariums with dividers down the middle and studied the equilibrium among fish. So just as kind of a, a mental exercise here, I've got eight fish uh, on the reactant side of uh, this aquarium with a divider on it. And I just want you to, you know, think a moment here how these fish might uh, divide themselves given enough time and inclination, I guess. So you might have expected, since there were eight fish, that these fish would probably spread out and we'd end up with four fish on each side. And I have a follow-up question here. Are uh, the same fish always on the same side? The answer to that is no. Uh, the fish are free to move back and forth and what's happening here is that the rate at which the fish are swimming from the left to the right is ex exactly matched by the rate at which the fish are swimming from the right to the left. So that's what equilibrium is. It's when the forward and reverse rates become equal to one another. It doesn't necessarily mean that the concentrations of my reactants and products are equal. That rarely, if ever, happens. So make a note to yourself because I'll probably ask a question to that ex uh, sort of uh, theme on the next test. Uh, equal concentrations doesn't necessarily mean that you're at equilibrium. Okay, so now that we have a conceptual understanding of how equilibrium works, we want to make math out of it. So can we express this distribution mathematically? Um, there are probably a variety of ways that one could do this, but the way it was chosen, chosen was to uh, express this ratio as a constant, so a capital K here uh, indicating uh, the equilibrium constant, and it's always expressed, it as, expressed as products over reactants, and for our simple situation here, it's the number of product fish over reactant fish, so it's 4 over 4, so my equilibrium constant for fish in a divided aquarium is going to be equal to 1, so the ratio is always the same 1 to 1. And what can we do with this uh, mathematical model? Well, if we have a mathematical model, we can use it to make predictions about other aquaria uh, in this case, or if we're dealing with chemical reactions, we can use it to predict what's going on in other chemical reactions. So if I go visit a friend's lab and uh, they've got a towel draped over part of the aquarium and I can't see it, but I can see the reactant side, but not the product side, so I can see three fish on the reactant side. How many fish are probably on the product side? The answer would be that there were three on the product side. And we knew that uh, just simply because we knew that they had to be equal to one another. Or uh, we could have you know, done it rigorously here that K was equal to one. And products over reactants meant that I had an unknown quantity over three. And when I solve that, I get X is equal to three. So we could have mathematically solved for that as well, rather than intuitively. Okay, so what we have in a chemical picture is that we have uh, a reaction mixture. So I've got a dark blue kind of line and a pink line representing my reactants. And as the course of reaction progresses, those concentrations increase. They never disappear uh, because we will start to have some of our products uh, bumping into one another and reforming the reactants. So uh, the yellow line represents the product, the hydrogen iodide in this case. Its concentration increases rapidly at first, but then begins to level off because uh, if we get enough of those product molecules uh, produced, they're going to start uh, falling apart and reforming the reactants again. And as soon as the rate of the forward and reverse reactions are equal to one another, we've reached equilibrium. And if I was looking on this graph and guessing where equilibrium was occurring, it looks like somewhere around about five minutes looks like where this 
has reached equilibrium. Okay, so um, if I want to express a chemical system mathematically, we're going to do basically the same thing we did for the fish. We're going to put our product concentrations over our reactant concentrations with a little bit of a twist here. So uh, our law of mass action here states that K is equal to my products over my reactants and everything will be raised to their uh, uh, coefficient. So uh, the coefficients on hydrogen and iodine are one. So I raise each of those reactants to the one power and then my hydrogen iodide has a coefficient of two. So I'm gonna raise it to the second power. So I'm basically squaring the concentration of hydrogen iodide. And then as anyone knows that anything raised to the one power doesn't change it at all. So quite often if the coefficient is one, we don't even write exponents for that. So uh, the final expression there showing hydrogen iodide squared over hydrogen times iodine. So even though hydrogen plus iodine is happening in our uh, written chemical reaction in the equilibrium expression, the concentrations are multiplied by one another probably the most missed uh, thing on the next test. Okay, so I'll pause a minute here and ask you to write some equilibrium constant uh, expressions for each of these. You can pause the video or maybe I'll just sit here and twiddle my thumbs for a, a minute or three. I can use do some of the, the Jeopardy music here. Da, 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 da. So uh, maybe you've been pondering this or maybe you've just been ignoring my poor singing ability. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's just a matter of putting products over reactants. Uh, I forgot to mention previously that those square brackets mean concentration uh, in moles per liter. So for the first one here, my K, and sometimes we write little subscripts next to this. It's mostly just bookkeeping. C just means that I'm measuring things in concentration units. Uh, if you go on to Chem 165, you might see Kp, and that Kp means that we're measuring things in pressure units. Um, you might see Ka. We might even see Ka in the next chapter a little bit. Ka means that I'm dealing with an acid. Kb means I'm dealing with a base. KSP means I've got a somewhat soluble compound, so uh, the subscript doesn't mean anything really. It's just bookkeeping. Okay, but ammonia was my product. Its coefficient was two, so I write a little squared next to the uh, ammonia concentration, and my reactants are on the bottom. Or, yeah, reactants are on the bottom. It's products over reactants. My reactants on the bottom. Uh, coefficient is one, so I raise nitrogen to one, and my hydrogen. Uh, the coefficient is three, so I raise it to a three. For the decomposition of uh, nitrogen monoxide, I um, have nitrogen dioxide and dinitrogen oxide as products. Their coefficients are one, they go on the top. Nitrogen monoxide has a coefficient of three, it goes on the bottom and its exponent is three. The tricky one here, and let me t tell you about this, you probably imagine something different, and what I will show you is this is maybe what you imagined, calcium oxide and carbon dioxide in the numerator over calcium carbonate, but if you uh, look carefully at this, uh, not all of the products are, or reactants are gases, so mainly what we're dealing with are gas phase reactions. Uh, I've got a couple of solids, so this is what's called a heterogeneous equilibria. There's two different states. So, uh, as it turns out, the concentration of solids, as long as any is present, is going to remain effectively constant. Uh, the grams per uh, unit volume is 
going to be sa the same as long as there's any presence. So the density effectively uh, is constant for any solid substance, no matter how much I have. So if the grams per volume is the same, then the moles per volume remains constant. So uh, deep thinkers way back when they were coming up with these said, well, uh, since they're constants, what value could we use to represent a constant that would uh, make our mathematical lives easier? And the wise uh, chemists of old decided that a value of one would be a, a good number to use anytime I had a solid uh, that's concentration was remaining constant. So uh, what's left over is just the thing that could change. So a gas, uh, its composition in a container could change uh, effectively, and then the concentration would change. So the only thing that is capable of changing is the carbon dioxide concentration. Okay, so once we know how to set up our equilibrium constant expression, we want to find numbers to plug in and calculate a value for that constant. So if I have my equilibrium constant expression, uh, products over reactants raised to exponents, uh, and then just read from the graph at the point where I've reached equilibrium and plug the numbers in. So I read from the graph these numbers, and when I crunched the math through, I got an equilibrium constant value of 1.3. Okay, so uh, just a chance here to try that on our own here. I've got a, an equilibrium here, the nitrogen monoxide uh, equilibrium, and I have some somewhat fabricated concentrations here. So let's imagine that these are the concentrations that we find at equilibrium for our system. You know, what is the value of the equilibrium constant? So I first need to write out my equilibrium constant expression, products over reactants raised to exponents. And when I take all the data that I've been given in the problem and plug it in the appropriate place, it looks like this. And then when I simplify that uh, by plugging those numbers through my calculator, I got a value of 2.1 times 10 to the fourth. So a relatively large number. So you might be asking, so what? We can you know, plug numbers in all day. Uh, what is this telling? Uh, what I do when I'm looking at equilibrium constants is I'm thinking you know, uh, about what it means in terms of the relative number of products and reactants in an equilibrium mixture. So I've got three potential cases here. I've got a case where K is uh, really large or it's gonna be very close to one or it's gonna be really small. So let's make up some numbers. So for instance, if I have uh, K equal to a million, even bigger than the one we just calculated, what my brain always does is think of this as a ratio of products over reactants. So I always divide everything by one and think of this as products to reactants. So in my mental picture, I've got a million to one ratio of products to reactants. So I expect in uh, this particular system with an equilibrium constant of a million to one, uh, I'm going to find a lot of products in my beaker at the end of the day. So the product concentrations are much greater than the reactant concentrations. Now if I have k equal to one, I divide by one, and I'm thinking of that again as products over reactants. So what does that mean? Well it means that my product and reactant concentrations are about equal. Now uh, I kind of apply a you know, factor of 10 rule here. So if the K is bigger than 0.1 but smaller than 10, so it's kind of in that slot between 0.1 and 10, a factor of 10 around 1, uh, our concentrations of product, product and reactant are going to be fairly equal to one another. Right? We're just talking in very broad terms here. Now let's look at the extreme example here where rather than having a million, I think I've got a millionth here, uh, one times 10 to the minus six, and again, I always think of these as ratios. So I divide by one to make it a ratio, and then kind of ask myself which number is bigger, the product or the reactant side, and I can see that the reactant number is uh, much larger. So that means that if I have a system where the uh, equilibrium constant is much smaller than one, I'm expecting to find mostly reactants in my mixture. So that wasn't a very good day uh, in the lab. Uh, 
uh, if I put uh, reactants in and I came back at the end of the day and there was you know mostly just reactants left over I didn't make much product uh, I might want to you know consider investigating other reactions if I uh, was interested in finding products uh, in any quantity so in our previous uh, slide where the uh, equilibrium constant was like 2.1 times 10 to the fourth I would expect that to proceed fairly far to the product side so mostly products in that mixture okay so um, another thing we can do is if I have an equilibrium constant and I have all but one of the concentrations I can plug everything in and solve for the missing quantity so uh, I took my equilibrium constant expression there uh, kind of turned it around I like my number on the left I guess for some reason and I've got uh, X is my unknown concentration of my nitrogen dioxide but I do know the concentration of the dinitrogen oxide is 1.1 times 10 to the minus 3 and the concentration of uh, the nitrogen monoxide was 3.5 times 10 to the minus 3 so if I was um, crunching these numbers through I want to get X all by itself one way to do that is just basically uh, multiply each side by the denominator and divide by the numerator uh, offending numbers that were up uh, near that X and things will cancel out and what I'm left with here is that X uh, at least according to my calculation was 0.82 moles per liter for the uh, nitrogen dioxide concentration